because a person who is passionate about what they do, you can just hear it when they talk about them. And, and that is infectious. And that, and so, you know, I think the three of us, we definitely passionate about attractions and I'm sure uh, I look at your background there. Like I can see the fair swim. Like, it's just, it's infectious. And you talk about it and it wants, I, I, May not ever want to skateboard, but when I watch that thing, I'm like, maybe I should give it a try because this guy seems to be having a lot of fun doing it. And so that's what I think it is important. Find that passion in what it is you're doing. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast, where we discuss the latest trends and challenges facing the attractions industry today. We chat with some of the top leaders in the field and provide resources that will help develop your career in this great industry. I am Josh Liebman. I am obsessed with the guest experience and helping attractions make that their top priority for success. And I'm Matt Heller. I am passionate about organizational effectiveness, leadership development, and employee engagement. Now sit upright, hold on tight, and get ready for the Attraction Pros Podcast. Do you want to become a Google Things to Do beta tester? In March, news leaked out that Google would be launching a new program for activities and experiences operators called Google Things to Do. Redeem is a Google Things to Do launch partner with a unique opportunity to bring a few qualified early adopter operators into the beta test. Interested in learning more about joining the Things to Do beta test? Email sales at redeem.com today. That's R-E-D. E-A-M. Hey, Josh, how are you? Hey, Matt, I'm doing really well. How are you? I am fantastic. Woo-hoo! Thanks for asking again. <laughs> um, say, I have a question for you. All righty. So you've played Roller Coaster Tycoon, correct? Uh, yes, I played it once for about 10 minutes, and I was completely satisfied and fulfilled. And really? I felt that I never needed to play anymore. <laughs> no, not really. I was I, just going to say, you're joshing us. <laughs> <laughs> I am joshing you. Uh, if you were to ask my parents the cumulative number of hours I, I played in middle school and a little bit of high school, too, they would it would it would be an overwhelmingly high number yes yeah yeah well i have i have two um and in roller toaster roller roller toaster roller, roller toaster. toaster tycoon you get to build all kind of rides and everything right and sure do. it makes you feel like you could actually build some of these things but i think our guest today is going to let us know that that's just scratching the surface there's so much more that goes into designing an attraction than you know dropping and dragging on the computer screen so i can't wait to get to this conversation with donnelly williams yeah this is going to be uh one thing we haven't referenced in a while one of those like peel back the onion episodes yeah because we are we are going deep into the topic of ride design and attraction development and boy are we getting granular when it comes to restraints and and uh and the actual you know construction and, and engineering that surrounds it and donnelly is filled with so much passion for what he does. Uh, he is business development development manager with Alltech Integrated Solutions, and uh, and he's a, a partner with the firm. And uh, the the things that he focuses on, and the projects that he's worked on, and uh, like I said, the passion that he has, and the curiosity that drives that passion, mm-hmm. uh, all going to be things that that we talk about. Uh, make for such an interesting conversation that we have today. Agreed. And what I think is really cool too is, you know, he's really passionate about helping kind of the next generation of engineers get into entertainment engineering. But, um, you know, to kind of hear his story of how he got into it, it's not a linear path, right, Mm -hmm. at all. Um, Mm -hmm. So it kind of took a lot of twists and turns. Um, And I think that's really interesting as a lot of the people that we've talked to on the podcast, they have really interesting kind of development stories. Like if you say, okay, where were you when you were 10 and where are you now? It's such an interesting path. And I think he's got one of those interesting paths that, you know, we can kind of take some lessons from like, you don't always have to do what you think the end goal is. You do something that's going to help you get there, maybe take steps to get there. Um, right. It doesn't always have to be, you don't go from being a, a 10 year old to the CEO of, of, a, of an amusement park. Mm. True. Yeah. 
Yeah, no matter how hard Most you try. <laughs> right. <Exactly. laughs> yeah. Maybe some people do. Uh, but, you get my point. Well, maybe yeah, a roller coaster tycoon park. There, there you go. Yeah. You I've, I've, I've overseen multiple parks <laughs> from, from that standpoint. Well, well I'd say uh, let's get right to this phenomenal interview with Donnelly Williams. Hey, Donnelly, welcome to the Attraction Pros podcast. We are so excited to talk to you today. How are you? Uh, I'm all aces. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. So Donnelly, can you tell us a little bit of your background in the industry and, uh, and even starting with your interest in why you wanted to get into the attractions and engineering business? Uh, yeah, actually, it's a, it's a funny story. I started back when I was kids. I originally, if you go back, I was huge movie buff, loved movies and thought that the coolest thing to do would be able to do like the things that make uh, movies alive. So I wanted to do special effects. So I thought that would be really interesting, but I had no idea how to do it. And this is all back pre-internet. Couldn't just Google it. Couldn't just find it on YouTube. So I was, you know, reading books, trying to find that stuff. And I happened to come across this TV show called Movie Magic. And the guy in this movie was filming a uh, this movie and he had an animatronic, well, an animatronic robot, early stage robot there. And he's like, oh, I'm a mechanical engineer and this is what I do for a living. And basically I was like, done, mechanical engineer, past that. <laughs> and then from that point, I basically went, you know, from, went to school in mechanical engineering. Uh, where I grew up in the prairies in Canada, there isn't a whole huge film industry. There's actually not a film industry. So it was uh, from there, just kind of worked my way down, ended up getting work in California for a bit and coming back to not, not in movies, but just, to, you know, try building my experience, working with a bunch of different companies, gaining skills and uh, learning how to be a good engineer. And then basically had the opportunity to come back to Vancouver in Canada. Uh, and lo and behold, when the industry that I was working in had a bit of a downturn, I kind of fell backwards into a job with a company, uh, Dynamic Structures at the time, now called Dynamic Attractions. And that was, I, it was, oh, you want to, we're doing a, a theme park design and attraction rides design. And so from that, I was like, well, I like attractions. I like rides. I like those kind of IP. Let's do that. Um, and from there, yeah, I kind of worked on. And then after a while working for there as a mechanical engineer, um, started to realize I'm like, these mechanical structures are pretty cool and complex, but, you know, without the brains of it, the controls of it, it's just this thing that doesn't really do much. So ended up kind of, I love to learn and love to study. So I went back to school and got my uh, electrical uh, engineering technologist. And then from there, uh, a, part, a partner of the company who I'd been working with for a while, Alltech, uh, I was able to kind of join their team and learn from their vast knowledge. And from that point, I ended up being hired by them and have been with them now for uh, eight years. So yeah, that's kind of, like I said, long roundabout story of how I wanted to make movies, but ended up in attractions and found out that attractions is way better than making movies in the sense that the, the things that you see in a theme park, they're meant to be permanent. They're meant to be structural. They're not, you know, thrown together with bubblegum overnight and then ripped down when the movie's done, like they're there forever. So the, the level of engineering and stuff around it is uh, much more skookum, let's say. Yeah. Well, and a lot of uh, attractions are based on movies. So in some cases, you might get to work on something where it's like there's a movie and an attraction. But, you know, I really appreciate what you say about the the attractions need to be engineered and created to, to stay um, relevant for a long time and actually to work every single day. So what was the difference in mindset between, you know, being an, a special effects engineer and then being an attractions engineer? Well, actually, I never got a chance to do special effects. I did a lot of fun projects on my own and I, you know, in the desperate uh, attempt to make a portfolio. But um, once I became more of a, an engineer, it was it, the cool thing I've learned is that all the previous years of experience of making, you know, industrial equipment and stuff like that, I, I learned that it's very similar. It's just got this uh, uh, 
all equipment is kind of designed alike, except for attraction stuff has a thick layer of safety wrapped around it. And there's so much more consideration to safety and, and guest interaction, as you guys would know, and all that kind of stuff. So that, that was a, a big learning curve, but, you know, uh, uh, metal is metal, pillow blocks, pillow block bearings work the same. It's just all in how you're applying them. Yeah. So Donnelly, tell us uh, more about Alltech and, and what you do and how Alltech serves the industry. Okay, so yeah, so my role at Alltech is uh, right now I'm the business development manager here and uh, it's Alltech at for Alltech Integrated Solutions. And, you know, one of my roles is to, you know, I work with our customers and we determine their uh, requirements. And then I, uh, we bring together our skill team of engineers and designers. And from there, we use our expertise and we apply the latest technology to, you know, meet or exceed really the customer's requirements. But as I say it that way, I think we got to roll back a bit in terms of like what Alltech does as a whole. And Alltech, well, we're a developer of manufactured uh, control, system, control systems and automations for theme park on theme park rides and many other industrial processes all around the world. You know, we've developed ride control systems for like a lot of different entertainment companies that you guys may know, and we've helped them solve some of their toughest safety challenges using our, uh, using automation uh, control systems and machinery. And I think one of the biggest things that all tech is known for with their control systems and the uniqueness of the way that they solve problems is uh we work really closely with our clients and during the commissioning stages of the attraction and that uh, interaction that we do and then the tightness that we formed during that stage has led to a, a lot of successful ride openings. You know, Donnie, I know you can't talk specifically about some of the attractions you've worked on, but you mentioned some of the tough safety challenges. And I'm wondering if you can kind of walk us through that process a little bit and kind of what goes into, you know, overcoming some of those safety challenges, whether it's about the guests or the team members or, or whoever it might be. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually was, that was probably one of the things that when I entered into this industry that I felt was really interesting is the way that they they look at risk, the way that they look at hazards and how it's a big thing where everyone sits around in a room and we all talk about it. We look at, okay, we want this ride to do this or this part of the ride is gonna do this. Well, what are all the things that someone can do? And what are all the things that, oh, a guest could come on and not be looking. And so they, you know, there's an overhead thing or, oh, uh, a guest may try, may be scared and try to unbuckle themselves. So how can we not let that happen? Or, you know, the thing that I thought was the most interesting thing when I entered into the industry is how you can get charts on the average purse body size and times and alarm length and reach and you and you design to the 95th or 98th percentile of all people. I, I didn't even know that was a thing, but it's like, oh, 95% of people can reach this far. <laughs> and so when you're doing a design, like make sure that it's just further than that. And, or, or you know, you would never think that it, you know, in a ride, I remember those one that we were working on and they're like, well, what happens if someone unbuckles their, their ride in the middle of the ride? I'm like, well, why would someone even do that? Like, that's not, <laughs> <laughs> why are we, why are we designing around that? But there, that is a, like, that is something that you have to be aware of. And I've seen YouTube videos of, people unbuckling themselves. And uh, there was one I saw in a drop tower. And so it's a thing that happens. So that's one of the things that kind of um, I find interesting in how, you know, in these meetings, like, you know, Alltech will be a part of it and the, the whatever the OEM is a part of it and the customer, the end user or the entertainment ride or the attraction is a part of it. And everyone gets together and everyone basically just throws up on a board being like, I've seen this happen. Oh, you know, on a ride like this, this is what we've seen before. And everyone goes and you make a big giant, giant list and that's your, um, your hazard analysis. And then basically if you go through it line by line, how are we going to get rid of this one? Is this one a problem? How do we get rid of it? And some you can get rid of using, you know, mechanical design and your harness will be designed such a way or you go, oh, if 95% of the people are able to reach this far up, then let's make it so that you, it blocks you. And then what can't be mechanically designed out? The control system will then look to take, take care of it. So, okay, well, we'll 
add in sensors. We'll add in these, these, uh, this ability to uh, monitor and keep the guests safe uh, without them really even realizing it. And then the final element of that is, you know, the, the operations. Well, don't worry, we'll go through and we'll make sure that they've checked it and locked it in. And once I've made sure he's locked in, your control system will, won't let it un unbuckle again and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, it's like, I, I always hate the word synergy, but it really is like the synergy of all these like stakeholders coming together and just like basically creating an amazing experience. What I think is really interesting, and my background and Matt's background, we you know we come from the operational side of the business. So we you know we started our careers of of telling guests not to take off their seatbelts and and enforcing those policies, um, and also enforcing the uh, I, I guess the parameters set in place by the manufacturers and the engineering. And so I think it's really interesting when you say. 95% of people are able to, to reach this far. So this needs to be designed, you know, factoring in, uh, you know, this percentile of, of guests. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that those who are operating the attractions have a lot of experience in is turning guests away because the attraction's not going to be able to accommodate them, whether it is a height requirement or if they're unable to, uh, you know, to fasten the harness in any way. Mm -hmm. And the questions that come from this and out of genuine frustration, understandable frustration from guests and saying, why did you build the ride this way? Why did you design the ride this way if I'm not able to ride it? Yeah. And it obviously it, it, it puts the operator in a tough position, particularly the frontline employees now having to, uh, you know, to work yeah. with angry guests. But I'm curious as far as what are those inputs into designing not just the attraction, but also with the ride vehicles and the harnesses that uh, that that sadly, you know, sometimes exclude uh, certain people from being able to participate. You know, it, it, it kind of comes down to a lot of the things um, that I've seen in my experience in the years of doing that. It's it's the equipment that you're designing with. Um, you so there's you know everyone there's a uh, ride where people ride on uh, robots and that, and so you're on a robot. Well, the robot is only strong enough, can only really safely carry and move people around and give you that thrill for a certain payload weight. So if you exceed that weight, which is not one person, but if the sum of the total exceed that weight, plus all the theming, plus all that, then you it won't run and it will take away from your experience. So thus you just kind of divide it up. Okay, well, there's five people on this one or two people on it, on it so that's the limit. Yeah, and so I'm sorry that you weren't doing and oh, okay, well, we have to design a harness or the harnesses are being designed. Like I've never done a harness design myself, but <clears throat> I've done some of the lock design and some of that. And when you're designing it, it's like, okay, well, I got to design it to fit everybody. Well, everybody's a big spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, well, I'm sorry. And I, I had to have this conversation with my son. He, uh, you know, he was small for his age when we went to a uh, universal and he was like, well, I want to go on the ride with my sister. Well, you can't. I said, well, why not? I, then you have to think, well, this is, you are smaller than that. So if you ride on this ride, there's a chance that you could slip out. As tight as they can make it, you could still sneak out. And that makes it not safe for you. And there, everybody's job here is to keep you safe while having fun. And so, unfortunately, you can't ride the ride. Would you like to go get some candy? <laughs> <laughs> Always the alternative. Fun alternative. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, Donnelly, I really appreciate that. I have a friend that I ride a lot of co roller coasters with, and he's really skinny. And he can like sneak his arm out of the middle of the harness and, you know, like almost kind of, he's never going to come out because he's too tall. You know, yeah. the, the whole thing's going to keep him in, but he can kind of we weasel his shoulder out of there. Um, and I mean, with my girth, I could never do that. But it's so, it's so interesting to think about how many different people, which you said was everybody, right, that you have to yeah. design these things for. But to Josh's point, ultimately, there are still some people who are just not going to be able to participate. And that's just kind of the way it is. There's no way that we can make something that, you know, every person on the planet would be able to um, participate in. So I, lo I love hearing those, those kind of discussions. I also want to dive into, um, you know, it kind of gets back to your path in just kind of taking opportunities that come that may not feel like they're, you know, your 100% end goal, but how, you know, just taking kind of different opportunities can eventually get you to the right place and, and give you different experiences that help you grow. Yeah, no, I think, I, I don't know, I can't remember where I'd heard, but basically for me, I knew 
growing up, like I said, have, having this goal of, oh, I want to make movies and do these things and knowing full well the industries that were available to me where I lived wasn't going to happen. And, you know, <clears throat> I don't have the resources to just up and move. Like, hey, mom, dad, I know, you know, we've let, grown a life here, but I really think if I lived in California, I could do this thing that I want to do. <laughs> um, so it really just kind of came down to, for me, looking at every opportunity, looking at anything that I was doing. And, you know, in my, in engineering, everyone was designing a lot of things around the oil and gas industry. And I basically said, well, I don't really, that's not my end goal, but you know, here's the design parameters. You have to look at something to clean this. Well, animatronics is robots. Robots is allowed here. Can I design a robot that someone can control to clean the pipe? No, not really. Here's what allows me to kind of build that skill, flex that muscle and get better at those things. And so that kind of started in school from there, basically approaching, you know, oh, you have a skill set that, I, that I've read in a book that it could be useful. Oh, Oh, I've read that this, that, you know, these robots are used, or oh, I've read that these kind of, this material is used here. And you, I've, I've heard that you know about this. Can you teach me about this? And even if it's like to be applied, something not specifically where I'm going to, I'll take that little piece. Met and all the people that I've talked to. And in terms of going back to your question, in terms of opportunities, I, I look at it the same way. I had an opportunity to, to work at a job and it was, it was, you know, designing, <clears throat> working at MEP firms and designing uh, HVAC, so all the stuff around there. But I looked at that as I'm like, well, that's designing and that's still drawings and that's still this. And it's still a lot of the things that I'm gonna need if I'm gonna build, if I'm gonna get to this end goal. So like I had, luckily I had that end goal there. So everything that I can look at is like, oh, well that's gonna get me just one step closer. And that's, that's worthwhile. Um, and then, you know, even to the, the other jobs that I've had, it was like, there's, there are smart, amazing people in every industry that I've worked with, uh, out, even outside of entertainment. And to basically just talk to those people, take, how do you approach a problem? Because problems are problems. Engineering is engineering and how you solve them. Like I said, unless you're uh, creating something completely new, it's you're using the toolkit that you have and, so I looked at it as like, fill that, tool, fill that toolkit up with as many tools as I can. And when I finally figure out how to get to that endpoint, I'm going to have a full toolkit. And I'll be like, oh, what do you need? Oh, I got one of those. Oh, I got that too. <laughs> That's cool. Thanks. Donnelly, Donnelly. What, you know, one of the things that uh, we've experienced in our industry and in, in a number of industries over the last year or so has been a, a big shakeup in unemployment and a lot of people who might be losing roles with their companies or getting furloughed or needing to find other opportunities. And uh, while that's tough for everyone, in particular for people who might be really far along in their career and they might think that this is the only thing that I'm able to do and might need to start start from scratch and might feel like they are probably beyond the point where they're able to start from scratch. Um, but how, how does that mindset and that attitude lead to ultimate growth and career advancement uh, of, of being able to really just hit that reset button? Yeah, that's uh, before, you know, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to join, you know, to, to, no, so before I joined Alltech, I was lucky enough to ha be able to sit down with uh, the president of Alltech and just kind of chat with him. And uh, in that conversation, learned a lot about, you know, the, the industry and the like, controls and stuff like that. And from that, you know, I decided at, you know, I was in, I was in my 30s. I had a brand new one-year-old baby and basically, like you said, hit reset, went back to school. But um, luckily, when you when you go back to school at that age and you're no longer it's no longer about, you know, having experiences and just enjoying, you know, I'm finally out of my parents house. I'm finally doing this. It's now uh, going here. You can go at it with a laser light focus. So while I was, I'd always go to the classes and I'd be there and I'd be like, no, no, I, I don't have time. When I go home, there's no time to do homework. I got a baby. I got a, I got a wife. I got, you know, I still have to work, still have a mortgage, all those kind of things. So it allows you to become, I think, extremely efficient, which then ended up 
you know, for me, helping me in project management and also like helping you sort out your time. And so I think when you're, when you go back to school, it's definitely scary to start because it seems like I got to start, I'm starting from scratch. I don't even know where I'm going. But then once you get into it, I found my personal experience is I found that you're in a class, you're like, oh, and, and whatever it may be, you're like, oh, well, well actually I did something very similar like that. And that skill still applies. And, you know, that skill still applies. And, and you, you start to learn that half the skills you have and may thought didn't apply because you've now changed industries completely. Well, while you may not be doing, doing, you know, you may not be turning a wrench to tighten a bolt on a, on a bogey system, but you are now <clears throat> applying that and actually maybe even moving forward because, you know, well, I've done that a million times. So I can now lead a team to do that. So I don't need to actually go back and just be, this one person, I can be this person helping out even more people or even expanding your, your horizon. Each time I've hit reset, which I've done a decent number of times, I end up, you end up having this, like you fall back a bit, but then you like almost shoot forward because you, you'll take that information on faster and then you're more mature. That's really what it comes down to. You're, you're more mature. <laughs> At least I was. I was probably pretty immature when I first went through it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Donnie, it's so interesting to hear you talk about that because I actually did that as well. I got to a certain point at one of the parks I was working at in management and I wanted to get involved in a larger company. And so I took a couple of steps back when it comes to, you know, where I was, what level I was in the organization and basically went back to a ride operator. And then because of my previous experience was able to kind of move up pretty quickly in that, in that new company. But I think my question for you is when someone's looking to do that, there's probably a lot, a lot of fear or even maybe even embarrassment about kind of taking a step down. So I guess what, what are your thoughts or what are your advice to people who may be in that boat? Like they're almost too proud to say, well, I'm not going to take a step back, but we've just proven that if you take a step back, you can take larger steps forward. So I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, I think, I think that kind of, I agree with you. I think that, that, that taking a step back is kind of a, a self-reflection. I, I kind of look at it in sense of it's a self-reflection kind of thing. And you take a step back, you figure out what you're going to go through. You're having to re-educate or do whatever. It's a bit, of, it's a bit humbling in the sense that you like, you, you, understand I'm going to be the people who potentially going, if it's going through school, I'm going to be going back through school. For me, it was going back and getting controls. I'm going to be with people who are, you know, 10 years, my junior, if at least, and that is going to be different and interesting, but you have to do that. You have to, you know, take it and you lean into it. You have to, you know, for me, it's about figuring, I want to do this. I want to get to this end goal. Um, and this is the path that I need to, and I could either be afraid of it, um, and not do it and, you know, sign myself up, just continue doing what I'm currently doing. Or for me, a mindset that I've always had is I'm like, I love to figure out what I'm not good at. And as soon as I figure what that, what I'm not good at, I lean into it. You know, I don't turn away from it. And that's kind of the way that I've approached things. And, and if I were, if I was to say a story kind of where that real life outside of the attractions industry is that, you know, like many, <clears throat> highly technical people, engineer people, I was terrified of speaking, um, of public speaking, speaking in front of any kind of a group. And uh, one of my best friends at the time had just gotten married and I was one of his groomsmen and it was great. You know, I was fine. We're sitting up there and then someone leans over, one of the other groomsmen leans over. He's like, hey, FYI, you got, you got to say some words in front of everyone in about five minutes. <laughs> And I think, you know, I have a pretty dark complexion. I probably was completely pale white. <laughs> and they said they looked at me. And then so I went up and I frantically got up in front of the group and did my best at the time to, you know, congratulate the new couple, talk about our history. And I've known him for years and years. We went through engineering together. Um, and my, I come back down and my buddy just looks at me and he kind of laughs and shakes his head. He's like, I've never seen anybody choke on air before. <laughs> <laughs> and so from that point, I, again, like kind of going leaning into it, I either could have decided I'm never public speaking ever again. But to me, I leaned into it and I was like, all right, well, how do I learn how to public speak? Toastmasters. Okay, great. I'm joining Toastmasters. And I joined that. 
and then got tons of, like, you know, through doing that, just doing it, flex that muscle, got a chance to be a public speaker a lot. And that communication, that skill that I, again, I'm in public um, Toastmasters with all these amazing people. And you could shy away, sit in the corner and not participate, but you just got to get in there. And that skill that I built there while again, kind of tying all together, unrelated to what I'm doing, unrelated to what I thought I would be doing, the communication led to being a, helping me become a better project manager, which I never even was on my radar at the time. Uh, being able to public speak helped me, you know, talk to team members and help motivate them to, to, to you know, buy into what we're doing to help us deliver the best product. So it's, it's those things that when I look back at it now, if I would have whispered to myself, it's okay, don't worry about it. You're going to choke on air. It's going to be terrible. But in the end, you're going to be better off for it. I've heard that uh, many people have a larger fear of public speaking than they do of dying. Matt, have you heard that? I'm sure you've- I have, yeah, that. yeah. yeah. <laughs> People would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. Right, oh, right. <laughs> Good way of wow. <laughs> oh, um, Matt, I saw a video of you giving a pub uh, public speaking at Ames and I just saw the size of the crowd and I literally thought the same thing. I'm like, yeah, I'd rather be getting beat up than doing that. Like it's, <laughs> uh, there's a million things I'd rather do than do that. But it's, uh, again, I think to myself, well, I guess I got to try that then if it scares me that much. Yeah. When you talk about leaning into your weaknesses or the things that you're not good at and then getting better at that, uh, you know, I think the example you, you gave of public speaking was, was phenomenal. I, I feel like there's a couple of schools of thought with it uh, that some people will say, instead of focusing on your weaknesses to focus on your strengths and just, just put more fuel on that fire over there and outsource the weaknesses, uh, you know, in, in any way you can or, or leave them alone. Uh, and then I, I think it really comes to a couple different mindsets of, of being a specialist and being very niche focused uh, versus being a generalist and, and jack of all trades. So kind of curious on your mindset from there. Yeah, there's definitely, um, and both of them are, are very good. Like it's the specialists that make all these amazing things that we use that create, you know, in our cell phone and our vaccines. It's all those guys who've basically dedicated a life of service in, in getting a specific skill set. I just knew for me, it's about, that kind of goes back to this knowing yourself. I just knew a personal preference that wasn't what I liked, I, I like, you know, if we were talking about operations and you're talking about something, I'm like, well, that's interesting. Let's hear about more about that. I'm ultimately curious about anything really that I come across. And so knowing that about myself helped me pick, well, when I was deciding to go back to school, do I want to, you know, instead of going back and getting, starting again from scratch and doing controls, do I want to just, you know, get a master's in, in, in mechanical? But it didn't make any sense because then one that completely locks off, you know, part of the spectrum. I can't do those things because I won't even ever know about it. And so that was a decision that I consciously made. And I think that's that's there is no right answer. I think um, for me, in my experience, I knew that I liked the idea of knowing a little about a lot of different things. So it 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 basically would cap certain types of growth. I can never be the guy who, you know, design uh, something from scratch all the way to completion in terms of by myself, because I won't know all this. I'm not a specialist in, in that thing. But I can have a conversation with you about it. I can ha ask it intellectual questions, which then help me learn more about it. Oh, and I'll turn to the next guy. I can ask him a, a good questions about that and learn a bit about that. And that, to me, ended up leading me to where to the management, the project management, because you're now, you're, you're integrating teams. You're, you're going, you're talking with all these specialists, all these amazing people who are so good at what they do and bringing everyone together. Cause you know, I got the specialist, the op specialist, and he's designing the perfect flow of the park. I got the, the controls team and they're designing this and you got this and you, and you have all the different teams or even within Alltech, I have my programmers, I have our panel builders, we have our, our machinists, and we have all these different things that we can do. Um, but if everyone's just doing their thing, it's going to be amazing in that little circle, but no one's going to pull all the stakeholders together and, and provide you with, oh, sorry, my hand's right to the camera, provide you with uh, something that's, that's functional and, and useful. 
And so that's kind of the decision that I made. I think I answered your question in a roundabout way. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and Donnelly, don't worry about your hands. We just call that 3D. Yeah, <laughs> I need the glasses for those. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you've mentioned project management a couple of times, and that's something that I know a lot of people dedicate, you know, their lives just to being project managers. You know, it doesn't matter what the project is. Um, so I'm curious kind of about your approach to project management and how you develop the skills to be an effective project manager. Well, for me, I the, some of the biggest things that I realized is kind of what I was initially talking about is like how um, working as an engineer, I, I, you would see all the different ways of people would manage and you would see um, all the different ways that people would try to bring a team together. And then being on teams, I would realize I'm like, oh, there's huge gaps and oh, this, this wasn't done. And, and I'm not speaking specifically for entertainment. It's just as a whole in all the different industries I've worked in. Oh, there's this gap that never really got taken care of. And now we're frantically doing it at the last minute. But then I've also worked with some amazing project managers and leaders, not just project managers, who basically will look at, can look at a problem or an issue or a company as a whole and basically figure out how to be like, oh, you know what? I, I'm not only going to solve this problem, but I'm looking farther into the future and I can help. If I set this system up, I will solve all of these problems in the future and then we'll just run better. And I, I believe, I think it was Josh, you were saying you're an efficiency nut. I love efficient. If I could figure out how to shave five minutes off of doing a task or even a 30 seconds off of doing a task, I'm going to try that thing. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, it's that kind of like need to be efficient, do that, that I think is that want, you want, you want to do that. You want to be able to uh, get all those people together. And then the other thing is occasion. Like if you like talking to people, you like being curious, you know, you have your different team members you have your drafters you have your programmers you have your panel builders you have your your team leads your uh, technology managers everyone has the insight to how a job should be done and it's it's the guy who can basically pull all that together and deliver it i think is where uh i won't say the sole value is but there's a huge value the guy who can deliver is like the, the guy who can pull the team together and deliver is the guy who can get jobs done you know, I've got to imagine uh, that being in this industry, uh, it's got to be really fulfilling to be part of a project or overseeing a project and then being able to uh, see it in real life and really be able to, to see it come together for consumer use. So when you're visiting parks, whether it's with your family or whether it's for work uh, and you see something that you've had such a strong part of, What's that like for you or, or what, what, what do you do when you're just observing it and you're now watching that, that guest who all they see is the finished product, uh, going through it and experiencing it the way that, you know, it's intended to be, uh, intended to be used. <laughs> I, uh, I actually, find that's, that's where I get to be the kid again. I get to, I love just kind of whenever I'm traveling for work or uh, when I was having to travel a lot or I'll go on site or I get a chance to go to a theme park, you know, just the, there's, it's great going with a family and watching my kids experience it. And then knowing that, you know, all these people and all these team members have come together to create this thing to give my, you know, my son or my daughter joy. And they just love it. And they'll talk about that for days. But I also love to just quietly be in a park by myself, oddly enough, and just watch and just listen. Just like you're, you're sitting there, you're watching, you're enjoying, you're just seeing how people get excited about being scared, get excited about seeing something that they've always seen. For me, I love even I'm a, when I'm a part of the team, I still love uh, looking at a, you know, oh, I read that book when I was a kid. And now this is exactly like I imagined it would be. I can now reach out. I can touch it. I can feel it. I can live that life where I, you know, I always wished, you know, you, you wish you could. I wish I had magic. I wish there were certain things like flying suits. I wish there were all these things. <laughs> and now I get to, I get to live out that imagination part of my life just for a moment, just for a brief moment while I'm in there. So that's it. And then there's the giant nerd part of me where I'm the guy that 
in on a coaster, or, you know, you're strapped in, you're ready to go. And I'm like, oh, what, what, what kind of sensors they use? I'm like, oh, like, well, how are they, how are they <laughs> right. And I'm not, since so I'm looking around and we're going, trying to figure right it out. So like, who are you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm looking down, I'm looking up. I'm like the, there's something happened over there. And I happened like, oh, that's how they look. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm like, so that's, so I usually, you know, because of that, I usually end up having a ride rides two or three times first time is to experience it second time is to start to look and see how things work and third time is to really get and figure out how things work and then one more time to experience it again yeah yeah <laughs> well i think we're all in that same boat that we uh we look at things like that and uh would, would want to um uh you know experience attractions multiple times just to kind of get all the different angles all the different views and things uh but you know donnelly as we're talking there seems to be a common thread that I'm hearing through a lot of the things you're talking about, and that's curiosity. Um, and I think it started with your very first story and it's kind of ebbed its way through the, this entire conversation. And I think it sounds like it's something that comes very naturally to you. But I'm curious if you know where that came from, like where your sense of curiosity came from. And then do you have any um, thoughts for other people to develop their sense of curiosity and, and always questioning and leaning into their, to their struggles? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think for me, the curiosity kind of comes from, I love, it, it's, I, I've always kind of, I think if you ask my parents and the number of, you know, radios or toys that were, I'd find the, the screwdriver and take apart and try to figure out how to make it work. It's that maybe was an inherent. <laughs> I think there's uh, definitely a pile and I'm seeing it now in, in, in some of my kids, but, um, uh, for me, curiosity kind of comes hand in hand with passion. And I love people who are passionate. Passion is infectious. Like, and it's, 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 I think helps drive you forward in, in whatever you do. Like when I first trend, was doing the transition from engineering to management, I thought to myself, why well, I was talking with my boss at the time. And I'm like, no, I, I still want to be an engineer. I still want to be very much involved in the design stuff. And I want to do this. I'm, I'm passionate about this. And, and we had a conversation about that. And he's like, you know, you, that's great. And he's like, but there's a ton of other things that you're not thinking about. And you can be passionate about the other stuff. You can be passionate about how teams interact and be passionate about managing people. And that is, that is actually far harder than you think, because while, you know, one plus one will always equal two, this person plus this person won't equal that result every time. They might not like each other. They may not gel well together for whatever the reason. So that conversation was, was really interesting. He's like, you have to learn to find the curious, like be curious about the things and be curious about people, but also learn to find something to be passionate about in everything that you do. I, uh, I, it, actually, that's funny. It brings me to a, a thought. I just recently, I was watching this show with my kids and it was about skateboarding and I was really into it. My, my daughter, she's like, daddy, what, why are you watching this show about skateboarding? And I'm like, I, I really like the show. These guys are really passionate about what they do. And I said, I will watch anything about passion because a person who is passionate about what they do, you can just hear it when they talk about them. And, and that is infectious. And that, and so, you know, I think the three of us, we definitely passionate about attractions and I'm sure uh, I look at your background there. Look, I can see the first one. Like, it's just, it's infectious. And you talk about it and it wants, I, I may not ever want to skateboard, but when I watch that thing, I'm like, maybe I should give it a try because this guy seems to be having a lot of fun doing it. And so that's what I think it is important. Find that passion in what it is you're doing. Even if, you know, you're just, you're grinding, you're hustling and you're grinding and you're just trying to make ends meet. I'm like, you can try to find something to be passionate about in the thing that you're doing, which will maybe help lead to more and maybe help you get, you no know, maybe noticed or something like, oh, that guy seems to be, you know, he's really kind of into what he's doing. It's, uh, I know it's very, a very old school Japanese thing. Like, you know, the guy, they focus in, you'd be really good at whatever it is you do. And I've always found that really interesting back. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I've always thought that passion is the greatest sales tool. And the example that you just shared, if if you would have been offered a skateboard at the end of watching that show, you, <laughs> the passion oh. of those of those people on the show, you would have been like, yeah, I, I have to try this. Yeah, <laughs> I want to feel what they feel. Yeah, um, exactly. 
one of the things that uh, you've mentioned as well as, and, and going back to, to talking about Alltech and, uh, and how Alltech is expanding further into the entertainment industry, are you able to, to share a little bit of that? Yeah. So, you know, Alltech, we've, we've uh, traditionally, we have a, a, a past that we worked with on a lot. We've done uh, wood and veneer and other type of industrial processes, but um, recently we've been, We've worked with e-ticket attraction. We've worked on retrofits, but uh, we have a facility. We've acquired a precision steel fabrication shop uh, around uh, 2016, uh, just in Texas there. And so now we've been able to add to our, our portfolio. And now we're looking at also within the entertainment industry, within the attractions industry, we're wanting to do more with, with uh, show control. So we're going to add to the ride control and that and starting to look to more about show control uh, systems and looking at uh, analysis in terms of, you know, the ride control, you're looking at uh, interactions between the ride and the attraction and people versus show control, you're doing the same thing, but there may not be that, that person interaction. So you aren't looking at it in terms of a, uh, such safe systems. You're not worried about someone being hurt as much. Um, yeah, there's, it's definitely something that we're looking to. We're going to continue on with the, that. And I know there's a lot of the things that were in terms of like, um, I say obsolescence, but basically upgrading and retrofitting because there's, you know, especially now with COVID, our industry has taken a hit and, you know, a lot of e-ticket rides, a lot of big new new plans that, that parks were maybe going to do aren't happening, but you know, you got to upgrade and keep what you have in the park running and running safely and running the top tier. And so one of the things that we're looking at doing is yeah, working with uh, regional theme parks as well as the, the top tier uh, places to help them upgrade uh, retrofit, keep them running and extend the longevity of all these different types of rides. And yeah. And, uh, as well as uh, attractions, yeah. Yeah, and I know to do all that, of course, it's not just you, it's not just your team, you're also passionate about kind of the next generation of engineers that are gonna come up and work in the entertainment industry. So I'm curious, what advice do you have for people that might be thinking kind of along the same lines you were when you were younger? Of, I think I might wanna get into that. I wanted to design roller coasters. What, what, what advice do you have for them? Uh, one of the things I think, I think probably the biggest device outside of, um, you know, if, depending on what part of the industry you want to go into reading about that and learning about that, um, the, uh, joining, there's two things. One, there are tons of associations and groups that you could join and they all have student memberships, which are extremely affordable and it is your ticket into knowledgeable people. I'm, I am been in the industry for a few years now, but I still go to these people and they, and they are willing to open their door and have conversations with you. Um, there's, you know, the TEA, there's IAPA, there's AIMS, NARSO, there's a ton of them. And you join any one of these ones on their student division, you're going to get access to people who you can pick their brains. And I will say, honestly, on the most part, everyone Every person that I've reached out to in a capacity of like, I'm really interested in this. I'm curious about this industry. Oh, you know, all in the beginning when Alltech was looking, oh, Alltech is, I'm working for this company and we're looking at getting into show action equipment. And like, oh, how, you know, how do you guys do it? Or do you, would you be open to having a conversation? It's like, while in some ways it would, we would end up being competitors, but not really. Everyone is really here to push the industry as a whole up. And that's something I find unique in this industry. Everyone is, everyone is out to you know, help their business and, and build their career. But as a whole, the industry is here to just do better, be, make better attractions, help people be more imaginative and bring what, what isn't possible and making it possible in terms of uh, just cool stuff. Yeah. And so that's, that's probably the, the, the two things is join the, join the associations and don't be afraid to shoot an email out. And uh, I know a lot of people will be like, well, they didn't get back to me. And I know it's been a week and they haven't got back to me. I'm like, then that's when you need to understand they're busy. 
Mm-hmm. They're really busy. Be patient. It's not that they haven't forgot. Not that they've forgotten. It's just that they'll get to it when they have time. But when they do get to it and they do put the time aside, you will get their full attention and you can ask those questions that you want to ask. So be persistent. Don't give up. Yeah, no, that's, that's good advice. Uh, Donnelly, if people want to shoot an email to you, I think that's a good segue here. Uh, and, and they want to get a hold of you or learn more about Alltech, uh, where would you send them? Well, you can learn about Alltech, you at uh, alltechonline.com. Um, that's our website. And to learn, to reach out with me, to talk about, you know, business development in terms of entertainment, or just to ask you a question, uh, you can reach me on LinkedIn, uh, Donnelly Williams, that's two N's and two L's. And, uh, or you can, yeah, reach me at, uh, at on the Alltech website as well. Awesome. Well, Donnelly, this has been a great conversation and I'm curious, I could ask you a lot more questions, but, uh, you know, want to be respectful of your time, but hopefully we'll get to see it in person at an association event here in the somewhat near future. But, uh, until then, uh, really appreciate your time today. And for everybody out there watching and listening, just remember we are all attraction pros. Thanks for listening to the Attraction Pros podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can tune in when new episodes release. And even better, please leave us a review on iTunes. For more information, visit attractionpros.com.